Thank you, Mr. Mara. Okay, call to order. Let, let me, uh, Mrs. Liu, if I may read the well, yes. uh, introduction. Please do. So uh, tonight's regular board meeting will be conducted pursuant to the provisions of the governor's executive order N2520, which suspends certain requirements of the Ralph M. Brown Act. The district will conduct the board meeting tonight as a teleconference. Please use the following toll-free number and ID number to call into the meeting. Telephone 1669900-9128. Meeting ID 881-3922. 7297, passcode 818447. Or you may join on a computer. The link is on our website at tusd.org. The boarded agenda is also available online. Public comments can be submitted prior to 3 p.m. on the day of the board meeting by completing the appropriate submission form at tusd.org backslash BOE backslash board hyphen meetings under quick links. Participants must be logged into the meeting via the Zoom link published above or by dialing in. Your Zoom participant name or phone number must match the name on the phone number entered on the form so that we may accurately identify you. The guidelines for public comment will be held in accordance with board policy 2350. Any individual with a disability who requires reasonable accommodations to participate in the board meeting may request assistance by contacting my office at 310 9726001 or fax 3109726012 thank you thank you dr stowe and now we have pledge of allegiance dr jeremy gerson would you mind leading us on a pledge as you wish mrs lu all right i see the picture that's ready begin I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic to the for which it stands, it stands one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, liberty, and justice, and justice for all. Thank you, Dr. Gerson. Item number six, adoption of the agenda. Can I have an a motion to adopt the agenda? So move. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Um, raise your hand and say aye if you're in favor. Aye. 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 And um, motion passes unanimously. Item number seven, report of the closed session actions. In closed session today, right before this meeting, the Board of Education approved by roll call vote, the settlement agreement and release pertaining to John AJM Doe, and a roll call was unanimous. Another item we had during closed session was that we voted unanimously to approve the following administrative appointment. Richard Valquez, he will be the director for purchasing and communication services. Richard currently serves in the role of a manager, facilities and operations for Torrance Unified School District having filled that role since 2018. He previously served as a grounds and operations supervisor from 2015 to 2018, and a grounds maintenance worker for two years before that. During his tenure here at TUSD, he filled the role twice of interim supervisor, Dis district night custodial services. And Richard joined TUSD in 2001 as cus a custodian. During this time, Richard earned an Associate in Arts degree from El Camino College in 2012 and a Bachelor of Science in Public Administration, Public Finance Man Management from California State University, Dominguez Hills in 2019. He is currently completing a certificate program with California State University, Dominguez Hill in purchasing education, procurement, concepts, and supply chain manufacturing uh, management. We're very proud to rec recognize Richard as one of our North High School graduates, the year to remain unspecified. We would like to congratulate Richard. Richard, I see you're here. Would you like to say a few words? I would, yes. Thank you. We'll have to do it later. Thank you. Good evening, board members, 
Superintendent Dr. Stowe and cabinet members. I sit here in front of all of you tonight, virtually that is, extremely grateful for this tremendous opportunity. As a proud City of Torrance resident, former Torrance Unified School District student and longtime district employee, I am honored to accept this new role. There will be plenty for me to learn moving forward, but I only welcome that new knowledge. And I look forward to working with all of you in the near future. So again, thank you very much. We're very happy to have you, Richard. Thank you for taking on the role. Yay. Thank you. All right, item number eight, recognition. Dr. Keith Butler, do you have a presentation or a recognition for us? Yes, thank you. We have with us tonight uh, Margie Fletcher, who's the regional sales manager from Gold Star Foods. Gold Star Foods is our frozen food provider. And during the pandemic, uh, we were able to work with them in a special program that they had that we were able to get more food out to needy families in Torrance than we would have otherwise. And Gold Star is being kind enough to recognize our nutrition services program led by the more than able, in fact, incredible Kathleen Cole. Uh, and so Ms. Fletcher, would you be so kind as to take it from here? Great, thank you. So good evening, everyone. So my name is Margie Fletcher. I'm regional sales manager for Gold Star Foods. We're based out of Ontario, California. And it's an honor to be here tonight to recognize the Torrance Unified School District Nutrition Services Department for distributing over 18,000 pounds of food through the USDA Farmers to Family Food Box Program. So this was a totally voluntary program through the USDA that your, your district uh, agreed to be part of. And it, through it, you were able to provide 20 pound boxes of food. So this was on top of the food that you're already distributing to families. These 20 pound boxes of food, two families, um, it, it was enough to feed a family of four for the whole week. And this really demonstrated your commitment to the health and well-being um, of the families in your district. So we just want to honor you tonight for what, what you're able to accomplish. And we want to present you with this plaque. And eventually, I, I hope to bring this to you in person. <laughs> but this is the plaque we want to present you with. Um, thank you, Torrance Unified School District. You served over 18,000 pounds with the USDA Farm to Family Food Box Program from Gold Star Foods. So we just want to thank you for that so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Fletcher. And of course, again, thank you uh, to Ms. Cole and her entire staff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item number 8.2, recognition of Torrance Unified School District retirees from June 2020 to December 2020. Dr. Mario Liberati. Thank you, Ms. Liu, members of the board, Dr. Stowe, members of cabinet. Th this is truly fun, uh, an exciting part of our agenda. I feel privileged and honored as well uh, to honor nine important folks uh, in our district that have served the district loyal, loyally for many years, uh, not replaceable. We will miss them tremendously. Uh, I think they, they retired early and far too young, uh, but we'll, we'll celebrate them anyways. Um, they join us here today. I'll read their bio briefly, and then if they'd like to say a few words, of course, they're encouraged to do so. Um, our first uh, retiree that I'd like to honor is Ms. Rita Anderson. Um, she and I have worked very closely together for the last 14 years. Uh, another individual that cannot be replaced, uh, missed her tremendously in the, in the office and, and everything that she did for, for all of our uh, students and teachers. Uh, Rita began her service in the district on February 12th, 1985 as an instructional aide at UConn Elementary School. In September 1988, she added the role of noon aide at UConn Elementary School and then March 1, 1996, was hired as school secretary one at UConn. In November 1998, Rita moved to the Human Resources Department in the role of Certificated Personnel Technician. In July 2000, she was promoted to Administrative Assistant where she remained until her retirement on December 30th, 2020. Not only was Rita a dedicated employee, but she served in a variety of leadership roles at school sites as a parent. Rita was PTA president at UConn Elementary School in 1988 and PTSA co-president at North High School from 1994 to 
1996. We would like to congratulate Rita and thank her for all that she did for our students and our school. Thank you, Rita, from the bottom of my heart. Really appreciate everything you did in supporting me and, and guiding me through uh, the tough road that we had sometimes, but lots of great times as well in human resources. I'd like to give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Liberati. I really appreciate receiving this recognition. It was a privilege to work in the district for the last 35 years. I had the opportunity to work with so many dedicated coworkers and administrators who will always be remembered. I was also able to see the district achieve many goals and grow into the exceptional district it is today. I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the board, cabinet, teachers, and staff for all your hard work especially during these challenging times. You are all to be commended for your leadership and commitment to the students and community of TUSD. Thank you again for this recognition. Thank you, Rita. Our next honoree is Ms. Filomena Benedetti. Filomena began her service in the district on September 1, 1988 as a substitute teacher. In September 1996, she was hired as an elementary teacher at Hickory Elementary School, where she remained until her retirement on June 12, 2020. We would like to congratulate Philomena and thank her for her service to the district. Philomena, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Dr. Liberati, and thank you to all the board members and, and uh, the administrators. I just want to say it was an incredible journey. Um, being in the Torrance District and how lucky I was to um, work at Hickory Elementary School for all these years. And, and I got to work with uh, Dr. Kim. Uh, he was my boss uh, for a while. Um, and all the incredible teachers that um, supported me, uh, especially the last three months of, of teaching, who would have thought that I would have been uh, retiring under the circumstances that we were you know, virtual learning and that, that was incredible. But, but thank you also to my husband and, and my kids and, you know, for always supporting me and who would have thought that my two daughters would be working in the district as teachers. Um, one of them, Christina, worked with me at Hickory. Um, we were practically next door to each other, but it worked. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And my daughter, uh, Donna, she was subbing for a while and now she's a teacher over at Burt Lynn. So, it continues, the generation uh, goes to another generation and now I'm retired and my husband and I are watching the kids, my new assignment. So it's a lot of fun. Thank you everybody for all these wonderful years. Thank you. Of course, and thank you very much. We've got some special people tonight, so many special people that I've got some help uh, in reading the bios and the next one, uh, Janet Furutani, uh, ben would like to read the bio and say a few words as he worked very closely with her as well. Dr. Egan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Liberati. Uh, Mrs. Liu, members of the board, it's my privilege to do this introduction of Janet. Hi, Janet. It's great to see you. Um, so Janet began, Janet Furtani began her service in TUSD on October 29th, 1984 as a substitute teacher. In July 1985, she was hired as a second grade teacher at Victor Elementary School. In September of 1993, Janet moved into the role of reading recovery teacher at Lincoln Elementary School and continued to work in that same capacity at Victor, Anza, and Torrance Elementary Schools. In 2014, Janet began working as a resource teacher, guided reading in instructional services, where she remained until her retirement in June, on June 30th of 2020. We'd like to congratulate Janet and thank her for her 35 years of service to the Torrance Unified School District. Janet, I'll turn it over to you. There we go. <laughs> thank you so much, Ben. I appreciate um, the kind words. Um, thank you to the board and the cabinet. Um, as I reflected on my career, I just realized that um, I was able to do all of these things to grow in my profession as a teacher because of all of the things that you provided for me in terms of trainings, um, new opportunities. Um, it, there was just, the world was my oyster. Um, 
some of the things that, uh, like Ben had mentioned, I started as a classroom teacher at Victor, but I was in the bilingual Japanese classroom at the time, which was brand, brand new at the time. So those of you, most of you don't even know because you're newer and younger than me, um, but that was something brand new. And when I had the opportunity, I jumped at the chance to um, give it a go and read in recovery. Um, and then most recently, it's not, um, was doing the guided reading resource teacher training team. And we were able to train uh, all the elementary teachers and the middle and high school ELD teachers. Um, had a wonderful team that I was with that Ben um, was instrumental in hiring as well. Um, I can never thank them enough for what I've learned as well. But um, something that um, is near and dear to my heart that I really look forward to is uh, volunteering. And I know right now schools are closed, closed. Um, <laughs> but uh, one thing that I have been um, helping out with um, is an organization called Bark Reading Dogs, or you may have heard it as Bark Therapy Dogs. And um, in the picture you saw myself with my dog, Wilson, uh, we are a therapy team. And I'm gonna continue to do that. Uh, currently we have a team at Arlington, Lincoln, Riviera, Wood, and two teams at CAR, um, but of course this year, we're not out there um, with our dogs, um, but the children get to come and read to the dogs in this non-threatening environment. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to see. Um, so I'm gonna continue with that. And my goal is to um, get 17 teams at 17 elementary schools. I know it's a big goal, but I'm gonna keep working on it. So um, I hope that maybe I run into some of you folks out there um, when you're visiting the site. So if you see uh, someone walking around with a dog with a blue bandana on that says Bark, you'll know that that's the organization that is supporting um, your children at, at our elementary level. And I just wanted to say that um, once again, I really appreciate all the support from the board and the cabinet members in terms of um, giving us the chance to continue with reading recovery, guided reading, um, the, especially now with the, the way that things are, you know, it's difficult for the kids and the parents and the teachers. And so from my, the bottom of my heart, I am very grateful that you are supporting these programs to continue the literacy for our students. Um, I'm lucky to say like Richard, um, I did grow up in Torrance. Um, I attended Torrance schools from kindergarten to 12th grade, go Saxons. Um, and when I run into anybody new, which is not too often right now because we're all kind of stuck at home, but I'm proud to tell them that um, I, I'm a retired teacher and I taught in Torrance Unified for 35 years. Um, it's a, been a wonderful ride. And I just wanna thank everyone again for all of your support and really thinking about what is important for our children in our district and Please be safe, everybody. Please be healthy. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Janet. Our next honoree um, is Ms. Anita Gladden. Anita be began her service in the district on September 18, 1978, as a middle school vocal music teacher at Burt Lynn Middle School. In September 1996, she was hired as a middle school English teacher at County Mayor Middle School, where she remained until her retirement on June 12th, 2020. We would like to congratulate Anita and thank her for all of her service to the district. And Dr. Gerson would like to say a few words because of the special relationship, both personal and professional uh, that he's developed uh, with Anita throughout the years. Dr. Gerson. Thank you, Dr. Liberati. Um, first, the, there's Mrs. Gladden, the teacher. You know, most teachers work too hard. You know, you, you spend your day with students and then when the day ends, that's when you begin your planning and your correcting. But Mrs. Gladden worked way too hard. Where we would try to get students to read a million words in a year, Mrs. Gladden probably read a million student words every few weeks. I, I was so uh, just taken aback by her commitment that if a student wrote it, she would read it. Where other teachers might look for something specific in an essay, not Mrs. Gladden, she read the, in, the thing in its entirety. Uh, but there's also um, the Anita, who's the mom. As hard as she worked as a teacher, um, she was also an avid mother of three boys. 
And I remember with her eldest, Curtis, he was an athlete. And in high school, he played football and soccer. And you better believe that Anna to the Mother had a rooting section. I know because I had to drive to Garden Grove to, to root him on. <laughs> and I had the pleasure of teaching her middle son and her youngest son. And so, uh, hi, Nick and Alex. And Alex also got to play on my soccer team, on my traveling soccer team. So I really got to know them as a family. So not only was Mrs. Gladden such a hardworking teacher, and we'll never know if it was the great teacher that became nationally board certified or the national board certification that made her great because I didn't know before that point. I just know that no matter how competitive I was, I could never beat her test scores. Um, <laughs> Principals tried to send more uh, historically underserved populations, more EL students to her, more students with disabilities, and she'd still clean our clocks um, because she was that good and that committed of a teacher and, and also that good and that committed of a, as a mother. And so I, I treasure our friendship. And whether you stay here in California or you try and escape to Pennsylvania, I will always be your friend. Uh, I love you and the boys and thank you for everything you've done for Torrance Unified. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Gerson. Thank you, Dr. Liberati and the board and, and all the administrators in, in uh, Torrance Unified. I, it has been a quite a journey and I've been very blessed to have had wonderful students all these years. Of course, some of them you always remember, maybe not so wonderful, but they were still in their own <laughs> way. They were, were very, um, educating even me. <laughs> so um, I just really appreciate all these 42 years that I spent in Torrance. It was quite a journey and um, I just, I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm humbled beyond belief. And I just thank you that you even allowed my two sons to go to Torrance, even though I lived in um, Orange County. And um, it was just, I, I I haven't read an essay since I left, which is kind of great, <laughs> but um, I, it, it's been a very great trip and thank you so much for everything that all the, all the trainings and all the, every, everything that, that the district has taught me. And um, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Anita. Really appreciate that. Um, our next honoree, uh, Dr. Crumpy and I uh, arm wrestled for, unfortunately, I lost. Uh, she will read the bio for uh, Ms. Hollis. So it is my pleasure to, um, to read this and to congratulate um, one of the most dedicated um, um, employees and professionals that I think I've, I've ever come across, um, Ms. Teresa Hollis, um, whose humor and grace um, taught me a lot because she actually trained me. Um, so Teresa began her service in the district um, in 1993 um, as an office assistant at Cali Mayor Middle School. And then she, and then she moved around a little bit. Um, she was at Berlin Middle School for a little bit. Um, and then um, something she doesn't actually talk about a lot was that she actually worked at West High School for a short period of time before she went back home where, um, where she is an alumnus of Torrance High School. And, and I had the pleasure of working with Teresa um, when I was an assistant principal there um, many, many years ago. Um, she, was, she was just the, the right hand to the left hand and, and the worker extraordinaire. Um, in 2005, she actually moved offices when one of her close friends retired and became the, um, the, the principal's assistant and, and right hand, left hand um, to, to the principal. Um, and she stayed there until her retirement. Um, we thought we were gonna get her a little longer, but she retired on Jul uh, July 17th. Um, we'd like to congratulate Teresa, thank her, thank her family um, for her service to the district. Congratulations, Teresa. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for the kind words again. <laughs> it's been a long time since we worked together. Um, thank you to the board members and to Dr. Stowe and the district administration. Uh, I enjoy going to work each day and serving the students in Torrance Unified. 
that made the 27 years go by very quickly. I especially have enjoyed the past 23 years at Torrance High School. It was home and the faculty, staff and the community were my family. I am grateful to Principal Burgess and the administration for their support. I also have the best view from my office looking over the beautiful campus. Um, I've been enjoying retirement for the past six months and seeing more of my family, my grandchildren. Um, I look forward to the future when we can travel and include more family and friends. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to work all these many years. I've always enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Our next honoree is Ms. Sa Sandra Honda. Sandra began her service in the district on September 20th, 1988 as a substitute instructional assistant. September 1, 1989, she was hired as an instructional assistant at Seaside Elementary School and the next year added the role of noon aide at Seaside Elementary School. In September 1991, Sandy moved to the role of health assistant at Wood Elementary School and in July 1995 to the role of health clerk at Wood. In October 1997, she began the role of health clerk at South and in February 1998, 1998 added the role of adult education registration clerk. In October 2000, Sandy began in the position of office assistant two at South High School. And in May 2007, she moved to the position of office assistant at Fern Elementary School, where she remained until her retirement on August 31st, 2020. We would like to congratulate Sandy for all of her service to the district and in her retirement. Thank you, Sandy. Well, I sure have a long resume, don't I, at Torrance Unified. <laughs> um, actually, my heart has always been children. And I actually, even before I came to Torrance, I actually started in 1978 with the preschoolers and I was a preschooler teacher in Northern Cal. And then we moved to Northern Cal, Nor uh, Seattle and then to Arizona. And in that time I had my own children during that time to be a um, teacher for. So from there we, I would, I just love being around kids. My whole passion has always been with kids. And so I, I always found a job looking for to be near the kids as much as I could. And so all that list of all the, those years doing from health clerk to all the way to uh, office assistants, you know, do you realize most of those jobs were part time? And most people have asked me, wow, you just did that 33 years? A lot of those jobs were part time. I said, yeah, yeah, really, it was part time. I, was, I could take anything I could. I actually ended up even teaching after school. At, if you watch those clay classes at the school. So I've been to a lot more Torrance Unified Schools um, because, because of that job of being a clay teacher after school. So all those years, all those kids, many kids, you know, I'd go on vacation and in the background, I would hear Mrs. Honda and kids would come running up to me and give me a big hug. And I go, where do I know you? Because there were so many schools and they tell me like South High or they tell me all the different things that they, why they know me and it's just that kind of life and being around kids is the reason I've, I've been in around kids all my life that you can't buy and you can't choose a better job than to be around kids. And I thank the board for hiring such wonderful teachers, wonderful principals, wonderful staff, and it's always been a pleasure to work for you. You know, um, just a few years ago, I was thinking, why didn't I become a teacher? Or why didn't I do something more? And I thought, hmm, I wish I had. And I kind of regretted it all those years. And then I 
heard this sermon from one of the pastors and he said, you know, as parents, you teach the greatest job you have is to teach your children. And you are like this, um, um, a guy who shoots a bow, a bow and arrow. You have a quiver and you have your arrows and you have them in your, in your back and you can only go so far. He said, your children, you grab an arrow and you put it in the bow and you shoot it. And those children that you've trained all your life can make you go farther. So that's the way I feel that my own kids, one's a teacher now, and one is in a church where she's helping with children. We, they have gone much farther than I even ever could. So uh, when you measure how far you are, you could be part-time, but you're with kids. My favorite job was the new maid, being with the kids one-on-one. -on -one. And when they come up to you and you teach them life lessons on how to behave, that was my best, my favorite job. Thank you for letting me come. I said, huh, should I go on? You've been just a part-timer, but you know, I know you guys have been there for years and years, Mario. I've seen you in meetings and, and you guys, you know, we are the ones that help the district on the bottom level. We're the ones kid, picking up the little kids when they get the boo-boos and you send them into the nurse, nurse's office and we are the ones that take care of them. We are the ones that actually, when I was at South High, one of the kids came to me and I noticed he was very sick and I knew in my bones, I need to call 911 and we saved his life. So there are, we do all kinds of stuff. You may not see us all the time. We may not raise our flags and wave them, but we're there for you. And I just hope you appreciate this all. Thank you for letting me come today. Uh, this uh, is my uh, last goodbye. <laughs> thank you, Sandy. Of course, we appreciate you and, and uh, uh, we'll miss you for sure. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank you, Mr. Lauberon. Of course. Our next honoree is Ms. Catherine Kelly. Kathy began her service in the district on October 22, 1996, as a substitute health clerk and substitute food service assistant. In April 1997, she was hired as a food services assistant at Torrance High School and later served in the same position at North High School. In May 1998, Kathy began a role as an ed assistant in special education at Walteri Elementary School and later served at the same position at Arnold Elementary School. In February 2004, she began a role as a paraeducator, Tier 1 at Arnold Elementary School and later served in the same role at Walteria. Continuing her career with Torrance Unified, Kathy served as a paraeducator Tier 2 beginning in 2006 and working at Richardson Middle School, Carr Elementary School and South High School, where she remained until her retirement on December 27, 2020. Catherine also provided service through her leadership with CSCA Chapter 80, 845 as president for the last 12 years, where she continues her service. We would like to congratulate Kathy for all of her service to Torrent Unified. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Mario. That was really nice. <laughs> um, I just really want to thank Roberta Bellier. She retired years ago. And she was the one that said, you have to try, go take the test and come and join us in special ed. Uh, never would I have thought that my career would be working with special needs students. It has been both rewarding and just so nice, those kids, just to see them grow. I will miss them. And in six months, Hopefully I'll become a sub and I can really pick where I wanna go work. <laughs> and I just, um, 
I'm really honored to even be the president of CSEA. There was a core group of us that organized us into the union a little over 15 years ago because we were unrepresented. And it's really nice to work with district and have a voice instead of just not being heard. So I'm looking forward to continue my retirement when we can especially go travel. And um, I do kind of miss all you guys, but I get to see you in negotiations. <laughs> but thank you for the nice things you said. Of course, thank you, Kathy. Our next honoree is Mr. Douglas Schmitz. Doug began his service in the district on September 8, 1999 as a substitute teacher. In December 2000, he was hired as a middle school science teacher at Casimir Middle School, where he remained until his retirement on June 12, 2020. We'd like to thank you for all your service to the district and what you've provided to our students. Thank you and congratulations, Douglas. Would you like to say a few words? There we go. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Liberati. Um, I just want to tell everybody what an honor it was to work with so many incredible people for 20 years. Um, it went by so fast, I, I still, can't believe that I'm retired right now. Um, I want to say, give my first thanks to uh, former principal at Casimir Middle School, Patty Hughes, who uh, was kind enough to hire me into uh, Torrance Unified because at the time I was really wondering whether I wanted to continue on being a teacher after spending my student teaching in North Long Beach. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have my principal at my first school <laughs> hook me up with Patty Hughes and, and, we, and it was just history after that. I learned so much about myself uh, from being a teacher. Um, I had such wonderful students, some who I am still in contact with. Some of my greatest memories of being a teacher in Torrance Unified are of course all the great trips I, get to, I used to take uh, the gate camps to Catalina Island and to Astro Camp. And uh, probably one of the finest times I ever had was when one of my former students came back years and years later, she wrote me a most beautiful letter about saying how my class, when she was in seventh grade, inspired her to go into uh, biology and science. And she was working on her PhD at, at the University of Florida and fish biology of all things and talked about the trips to Catalina that we had taken. And then she came back and talked to my students. And just the other day, I, I'm gonna say, I could never go into the witness protection program because forever, wherever I go, uh, somebody yells my name out. And all of a sudden I'm like, how could you know me from, you know? <laughs> so the other day walking around uh, the park in my hometown here, not Torrance, I hear my name being called out from afar, Mr. Schmitz, <laughs> from some adult children, of course, now. And uh, so anyway, they recognized me and wanted to say hi again. Um, it was just 20 wonderful years, uh, worked again with just such great people. And I really appreciate my time at Torrance Unified. Thank you very much. Of course, thank you. And our final honoree for today, is Ms. Cynthia Sorensen. Cynthia began her service in the district on January 6, 1987, as a substitute teacher. In September 1988, she was hired as an elementary teacher at Arnold Elementary School, where she remained until her retirement on June 12, 2020. We would like to congratulate Cynthia and thank her for all of her service to the district. Congratulations and thank you, Cynthia. Would you like to say, oh, there you go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, it's been a real pleasure working with Torrance Unified and all of the employees and the staff and there just aren't enough words to describe how wonderful my years were with 
the Arnold staff and the Torrance family. Got to meet a lot of wonderful people through my 30 plus years. Um, I have a lot of treasured memories of former students, families, and coworkers. It's always a wonderful thing to be doing a back to school night and have a parent sit and drop their glasses and say, you know what, I was in your class as a third grade student. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm officially old. <laughs> but I have a lot of really fond memories. And um, I think that people are so dedicated in Torrance and I really appreciated that as an employee. I'm honored to have been such a part of such a great team of people. And I appreciate the board for all of their dedication and their time right now. Um, I'm thankful for all the opportunities that I've had. And I just want everybody to stay safe and healthy. And I thank you for your kindness. And, um, you know, they say one door closes and another door opens. And I kind of feel like that's kind of where we all are now. Other things are gonna open up for us. and. We're in a holding pattern, but that's okay. You know, we've we've been blessed with a lot of goodness, and I thank you all so much for that. Thank you. Of course, and thank you. And again, thank you to all of our retirees. Uh, we will certainly miss you all, um, but we wish you all the best going forward. And by the way, a nice certificate will be mailed out tomorrow, along with this great clock that we're all looking forward to one day. But uh, congratulations again. I would ask for another round of applause, uh, but we're virtual. But again, congratulations and all the best going forward. Take good care and stay well. Thank you very much, Dr. Liberati. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Thank you. OK. This, Thank is you, Dr. Gladding. this is Gladding, you taught my daughter, Kiki, <laughs> the one that's now in the church that is, she's, wow. she is, she's, it's growing by leaps and bounds because of her ministry. And that's awesome. I, think, I thank you for, she texts me, oh, say hi to Mrs. Gladding. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Sounds great. Someone's great English teacher. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bless your daughter. You're Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Item number 8.3, Balfour Beatty Construction. Uh, Dr. Stowe. Thank you, President Liu and board members. I'm, I'm so glad that we changed the, uh, or, or that when we changed the meeting from a recognition meeting, we were able to still incorporate uh, some recognitions uh, and, and the, the, the teachers and other staff uh, just fantastic. So thank you, Dr. Liberati, for coordinating that. It was, uh, that, that was great. Um, I would like to uh, recognize three other members of the, the TUSD team that have been here uh, since we passed original bonds back in 2008. And, um, and so it's, it's now an honor to be able to recognize uh, three people that, uh, that have really committed a lot of time and energy to um, being part of, part of our district. Um, We've worked with Balfour Beatty Construction on the, the program management side, as well as construction management. But I'd like to recognize three individuals of the program management team uh, who have really been here since the beginning and committed to Dr. Mannon early on that they were going to be here until we finished these projects. And so they are um, tremendous uh, members of uh, the kind of the behind the scenes team. And they are um, senior program manager, Tom Schlegel, architect and program manager, um, Brent Palmer and Angie Garcia Turner, who is the senior program specialist. And uh, they, they, for the last 12 years have worked over in the Balfour Beatty trailer uh, uh, next to the Torrance High parking lot. Um, and, you know, just, just did a tremendous amount of work. Uh, they were involved in the entire process. So from site meetings where design took place to close out, uh, of you know, working with the division of the state architect. They remained committed to ensuring that the Torrance taxpayers got all their projects done on time and closed with certification. Uh, they were also leaders in working with the Independent Citizens Oversight Committee. 
Remember, these are the 13 citizens appointed by the board to make sure that uh, that all of our bond expenditures are in line with with the uh, the language of the bonds that, that were passed by the voters. And so they, they worked with that uh, those 13 uh, individuals very closely. They interfaced with contractors and other vendors on behalf of the district uh, and also worked with sites and different departments to make sure that uh, all the paperwork was completed so that we could pay the various contractors that we worked with. As deputy superintendent for the last four years, I relied heavily on their um, the accuracy of their work and I'm thankful to them to is being a thought partner during some some tough projects that we had to really kind of think through of how we were going to go about approaching them uh, and, and ensuring their their completion uh, with, within the, the the budget that we had. Um, so that that team also uh, led by Tom Schlegel was instrumental for seeing a number of the Sharefest projects completed over the the past 12 years. Uh, they they would hold an annual golf tournament that raised significant amounts of money uh, that went right back into uh, not just Torrance schools, but uh, schools across the South Bay. Uh, and so their commitment went far beyond the scope of the work that they were hired for and were, were a better community because they were part of our work. So as we wind down the, the bond work, um, Tom's last day was Friday, actually, uh, and Brent and Angie are completing their work in March. I, I would just like to give a huge thank you and recognize them for their hard work and everything that they've done for TUSD in uh, a very successful uh, for, for school bond campaign and completion of projects. Thank you. Are they here tonight? Would they like to say a few words? Um, I, I, I don't think so. I think they, they like being behind the scenes. Uh, I, I, I will send them a-, a I'll a say thank you. Thank, thank you. It's been a pleasure working with all of you guys. So just wanted to say thank you. And that's it. We are more behind the scenes. <laughs> thank and you. Actually, if I can make a comment, I want to thank them as well. Um, uh, they've been a big supporter, like I said, for TUSD, but even our smaller schools. Um, when I was at Adams and we had our um, alliance that established that we had a golf tournament and Balfour Beatty uh, made that golf tournament possible. And we were able to raise funds for the past, for like six years at um, Adams. And so we are grateful. Uh, please express my gratitude, especially to Tom Schlegel and all those guys. We're grateful for your partnership. Okay, great. Uh, moving on to item number nine, staff presentation and information. 9.1 is introduction and report of student representative to the board, third quarter. Dr. Egan, I believe we have a new student representative. We do, yes. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Liu. Um, I'd like to uh, go ahead and introduce our new student representative, Armin Baglioni from Torrance High School. Uh, prior to serving as in his current role, ASP president, um, Armin was a junior class president. In addition, he's a member of the boys volleyball team, a member of CSF, National Honor Society, and is currently first lieutenant in Tartar Knights. Armin also serves as the president of the Make-A-Wish Club. He currently takes rigorous courses and has volunteered at First Christian Church. Welcome, Armin. And now why don't you tell us what's happening at Torrance High? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so right now at Torrance High, uh, through COVID, we've tried our best to keep events running as smoothly as possible and just try and get our student body as involved. Um, so our, our probably our most important event was the canned food drive that we hosted. We host one every year, but uh, this year it was quite challenging to do one through COVID and make sure everyone stayed safe. But uh, we pushed through and managed to uh, bring in 15,000 cans that we were able to donate to the El Camino Food Bank. So that was just a really wonderful thing that our school was able to come together and donate for. Um, we also held a Operation Gift, which is basically an event that we do at Torrance High, which raises money for the families in need here. And we actually did a pretty good job raising $2,000 uh, to share around with those families. 
Um, we recently uh, put out a Hands Across Campus video, which basically it encompasses all of our culture clubs at our school to rejoice in our diversity. And we just thought it was important to put out, especially with everything going on in the world right now. And so it was just a pleasure putting that out, just letting the people know that we hear them and we see them and we still wanna continue it, even though it is a little bit harder now. Um, we have been holding blood drives uh, with UCLA and we've just been getting students to sign up to donate blood. So that's another good thing. And then also we've been holding virtual spirit weeks uh, to promote our school spirit. And we've been having students uh, post pictures of themselves uh, dress up and we've just been posting that on our Instagram and just publicizing them. And then um, lastly, we did a freshman senior buddy week just to give some freshmen just that introduction to high school and not just feel too scared with coming into a new school and not really being able to experience it their first year. And that's just a brief rundown of some of the things we've been doing at Torrance High. Thank you, Juan. Item number 9.2, Interim Superintendent's Report. Dr. Stowe, do you have a report? Yes, thank you, President Liu and board members. Um, it's uh, been another, well, it was a busy month of January, as you well know. Um, but, you know, we, we have been able to uh, successfully uh, complete the, um, you know, the, the closure of the, the cohorts that were operating. Um, and I'm happy to report to you today that today we brought back um, all of our blended uh, transitional kindergarten, regular kindergarten, and first grade students. Um, it went very smoothly. It was their second first day of school of, of in-person learning. Uh, and, uh, and a big thank you to all of our staff, the teachers, the, the classified staff, custodians, um, office assistants, administrators, everyone um, that, that made this um, go very smoothly today. Uh, I visited a couple schools and the principals reported that the students, even the first graders who had only been on campus one week prior to um, the, the, the closure, uh, that they knew exactly what to do, where to go, uh, knew all the rules and, and really followed the guidelines. And so it was, uh, it was great to see uh, those students back on campus. We also had today the restart of some of our in-person instruction for high needs cohorts, as well as uh, uh, resuming at high school athletic conditioning under the youth sports guidance uh, that uh, uh, is published by the DPH. And, and I know there are other programs that are wanting to uh, be on campus, um, but at this point in time, we, we follow the uh, DPH guidelines uh, for, for youth sports um, and, and you know athletics. Uh, we are also hearing that there may be some athletic competitions uh, being allowed, but um, again, in LA County, that has not been our experience. So um, the, the conditioning is the best we can do for our students at this point in time, uh, but expect some, some more news on, on that in the coming weeks. As part of the uh, new DPH health orders that were uh, released on Friday, uh, January 29th, the cohort size was increased from 12 to 14. And at the previous board meetings, we've talked that, uh, that we, we need that from move from 12 to 14 in order to bring back any, any further grades. And so uh, based on that, we are going to welcome back our second grade blended students uh, to in-person learning next Thursday, February 11th, along with other TK through one students who were temporarily put in distance learning uh, back in November uh, because of the limit on the cohort size. And as you know, we need to wait for grades three through five until the county allows our, our waiver to be extended to those upper grades. Um, uh, again, we were told uh, in November that the DPH has every intent to allow those, those uh, additional grades uh, above grade two, uh, and we await that guidance from the DPH. So um, more updates to come on that to the board as well. Uh, we still don't know if sixth grade would be part of that waiver um, because, or if it's only for six elementary schools that, have, that serve sixth grade students, uh, which obviously we don't have here in TUSD. Um, because of scheduling, sixth grade return may be a little more difficult. Um, but again, we, we wait for further DPH guidance before even 
uh, bringing a proposal to the board uh, should that be allowed uh, this, this, uh, this spring. Uh, it was also exciting last Tuesday that we had 529 11th graders take the PSAT uh, at our high schools. These juniors were so happy to be back on campus, even just for a limited amount of time. Uh, how many of our, our students are, are, are looking forward to coming to campus to take a standardized test? Um, but, but I know these students were, were very excited about that. Uh, and uh, many of them, uh, this was their first time on campus since, since March. Um, and, and again, uh, I thank the board for uh, uh, allowing the, those students to, to have that experience and also thank all the school staff for the preparations that went into uh, making that happen. Uh, on the vaccination front, uh, uh, we really don't have any additional information beyond what I've shared. Uh, Dr. Butler is continuing to work with the city of Torrance on a vaccination plan for when those do become available. Um, we are closely watching for further information from the DPH. Uh, I, I know we do have some employees that qualify because of um, the, their age or other work they do outside of TUSD. And so I encourage those folks that um, are able to get the vaccine uh, to do so. Um, but you know, just before the meeting tonight, uh, about five minutes before our meeting started, I received a, an email from the LA County Office of Education saying that they are um, still anticipating that educators will be eligible to receive the vaccine in February. Um, but again, with, uh, with, with the way it's organized in the state and the county, uh, we, we kind of are at the mercy of uh, when the vaccines become available for our employees. But um, we're again, we're watching that very closely. Dr. Butler is in communication with uh, not just uh, staff at the city, uh, but also local hospitals to see um, if there's any other uh, ways that we can go about um, getting vaccinations for our employees. And then finally, uh, today we also posted the required COVID prevention plan to our website. Uh, it's also a document that we had to submit to the county. Um, uh, all school districts, this was required for, for schools that opened. Um, thank you to uh, Dr. Egan and, and Dr. Butler for, for working uh, to, to ensure that this was completed on time and posted to our website and submitted. Uh, and as you know, all TUSD employees are responsible for making sure that safe practices are being followed, that we're complying with directives from the DPH, policies and procedures are in place uh, because we want to have a safe environment for all staff and students. And I also want to just take a minute to emphasize to all of our families the importance of uh, them following these guidelines as well, uh, because it, it really takes all of us to make sure that, um, that we can get as many students on campus uh, and, and do it safely. So um, thank you, President Liu and board members. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Dr. Stowe. Does anyone have any questions from the board? Okay, item number 10, oral communications and scheduled hearing on agenda items. The Board of Education welcomes input from the public. In compliance with Governor Newsom's Executive Order N2520, in response to the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak, the district will conduct the Board of Education's regular meeting as a teleconference in order to discuss the district business in an orderly manner and to help staff respond more directly. The board policies require that the public comments to the board comply with certain procedures, including one, public comments can be submitted prior to 3 p.m. on the day of the board meeting by completing the appropriate submission form at www.tusd.org backslash BOE, backslash board meetings. Two, public comments to non-agenda items may address only items that are within the subject, juris subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Time allotted for such comments is limited to three, three minutes per comment. Total time allotted for the public input on non-agenda items is limited to 30 minutes. Three, a speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another. Four, the commentator's, uh, the commenter's name must match the name on the public comment submission form. Five, complaints against employees or students will normally be heard in closed session 
and the district's complaint procedure should be followed before discussion with the board. The board may disconnect disruptive individuals from the teleconference if necessary. Any person who willfully disturbs any public school meeting is guilty of a misdemeanor. Education Code 32210. Um, before we start the uh, public oral communication, um, as the board member, as a board president, I see that we may have parent comments this evening from several parents from one of our elementary schools. I would like you to know that the board members have reviewed your comments and have received updates from our superintendent and the school principal. This afternoon, all of the parents in the affected fourth grade class were advised by email that the new classroom teacher will continue with the fourth graders for the remainder of the whole school year. Thank you for sharing your comments and concerns with us. Mr. Mara, will you let in the first speaker, please? Um, may I interrupt, Mrs. Liu? I'd like to ask a question. Um, okay, board uh, member Gerson. Thank you. Um, Dr. Stowe, the script that was prepared for Mrs. Liu on the instructions, I wanna clarify. Um, we just stated that all comments have to be submitted by 3 p.m., but our um, website says 5 p.m. Would you please clarify that instruction so that we um, are fully accurate? Well, we'll, we'll update the website. Uh, we, we have just because of the, the time it takes to make sure that, that we've got everything. Um, the practice has been 3 p.m. since uh, I, I think this whole school year. So um, I'll correct the website. Uh, but I will also say that the, um, the opportunity it, it still remains open. We don't, we don't, we don't cut it off. Uh, and the last submission that we have for speaking was at 1.56 this afternoon. So, um, so even, even with that discrepancy, there, no, nobody's getting kicked out because it does remain open. Thank but thank you. You, thank you for pointing that out. We'll get that corrected. Thank you, Dr. Gerson. Mr. Mark? Yes, uh, we have Maribeth Borowski. Maribeth, you can go ahead and turn your mic on. Oh, um, I'm actually reading a letter with um, my colleague, Donna Devonzo, and she was going to read first. I thought she had submitted her name first. Can we change the order? Sure. Uh, let me pull up. Go ahead, Donna. Thank you. School board members, teachers, students, parents, and the Torrance community. We, the teachers at Magruder Middle School, feel compelled to write you about the possibility of bringing back our sixth grade students prior to the whole student body returning to campus. While we know that on campus is where we all hope our students to be, and they will have the most support, we have serious concerns about splitting our students and staffs up this way. By making such a decision, you will be creating a variety of issues that will affect the students, families, teachers, and staff. Even though sixth grade may be considered elementary under the waiver, they are a vital part of the middle school community in Torrance. We ask that you consider sending the entire middle school population back at the time it is deemed safe for everyone, not one grade at a time. We pose this question, are we ready for the entire office staff, cafeteria, support staff, and aides to be on campus for only one third of the kids? How will these same people be able to assist the virtual seventh and eighth graders while they are alive with the sixth graders who are on campus with them? This would mean additional support staff on campus who would need to find a place to go on the periods when they assist the seventh and eighth graders virtually. And this begs the question, why would we put additional people at risk if we don't have to? Additionally, the entire master schedule would need to be redone so that hybrid learning can take place for sixth graders at the middle school level. This will disrupt, disrupt our students' schedules and create an additional feeling of instability for our students. We wanna be the calming, stable force for them in their ever-changing world, not add to their anxiety. Middle school currently follows a schedule similar to the high schools. So would the sixth graders still follow the same schedule or would the high school schedule have to be changed to accommodate the sixth graders coming back to campus? 
And I am finished. Thank you. Go ahead, Mary Beth. Thank you. Another issue is with classes with students in multiple grade levels. This would have to be thought out when redoing the master schedule. We have many classes on our campuses that are mixed with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders in them. Would teachers teach virtually with their seventh and eighth graders while being live with their sixth graders? This basically means teaching two classes at the same time, barring any technical issues during the class. If sixth graders come back early, they will lose instructional time. Under the virtual model, sixth graders receive 185 minutes of direct teacher interaction per class each week. Under the hybrid block model with the cap at 14 students, they would only receive 75 minutes of direct teacher interaction. That's a 60% reduction in teacher direct teacher interaction per week. This is an issue that all grade levels will eventually encounter, but why take away FaceTime from the sixth graders earlier than the other grade levels. This means parents will be responsible for more of the direct instruction interaction that teachers are now taking care of with virtual instruction. Perhaps parents were not aware of this when they decided to do the hybrid model, but this is going to directly impact the students and their families with increased stress and added pressure to complete work that they are currently doing online with their teachers. Further, when changing the sixth grade class times to accommodate hybrid learning, the seventh and eighth grade schedules must also be adjusted. This adjustment, which is a reduction in real-time instruction for seventh and especially eighth grade students will result in students who will be unprepared for high school. It is a recipe for reduced college acceptances, failed classes and dropouts. And as an aside, that means the high school schedules will change as well because some middle school students attend high school classes. When we are so close to having the opportunity for the education community to be vaccinated, which would allow for teachers and staff to freely go back and teach their students with the confidence that they are safe, why are we reopening prematurely? The risk to our school community is not worth the reward. We believe that our students deserve the best possible chances for success and we have done everything within our collective power to make that happen given our current set of circumstances and restrictions. Working with the school board, we hope that you will consider the benefits of returning all three grades of middle school at the same time when it is safe for our community. Respectfully, the teachers of Magruder Middle School. And I will be sending this to you so that you can read it and just go over and um, we welcome any questions that you have. And, and uh, if you want to ask us our opinion, we're open to that. Thank you. Okay, next we have Elita Hazje. Go ahead. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for addressing the issue that um, the parents and I were concerned about with Seaside Elementary, what happened in the classroom. Um, rather than rehash it because you've received the letter, I'd like to encourage um, you to think about how we felt as parents when the issue at hand took place and no one reached out to us um, it was days before someone reached out to us. Instead, we received a deceptive email that said that she was sick, but did not directly address that, they, that there was an issue that occurred and that they would be working on it and would get back to us. We had to come together as a group to force the issue and to be heard. And it made us feel, um, I'll speak for myself personally and let the others, it made me feel um, betrayed as a parent, um, as a taxpayer in this community, as a person that lives in this community, that has three children and two more getting ready to enter the school system. It made me um, question how involved the district and this board is with Seaside Elementary School. And so I would really like to encourage Dr. Kim, who I have called his office before, to get involved in what's happening 
this is a good district with good people. It is becoming stagnant because there is absence. We are not modernizing the school. We are not paying attention to the teachers and how they are treating our children. We need more transparency at the school level. I have made maybe three very serious complaints that I still can't get confirmation whether or not it was forwarded to the district um, by, by the former principal. There needs to be more transparency about process. Uh, and I think that those of you on this call that seem to really love this district and have worked in this district, get involved, show up, check in and get with parents like myself, parents of diversity, get involved with us. How do we modernize Seaside? There's so much that's happened in the last year and I don't, I feel that this board is sleeping and there's so much opportunity and you don't wanna let this go. We were disappointed and I looked at this as an infrastructure issue and as a systemic issue and how you responded to a very serious issue that happened in the classroom in front of our teachers. Why weren't we contacted and, and, and offered a counselor uh, for our child or for our children that might have witnessed that? Why didn't anybody proactively reach out to a parent? Why did you force our hand when we love this district and this school? Why did you force us to fight? And so I really want all of you to really think about that. Think about when was the last time there's been significant changes, not only Seaside Elementary, but other schools. And let's fix this situation. Let's not put a bandaid on it. Thank you. Okay, next we have Desiree Flores. Hello, hi. Um, I've contacted you guys previously on previous years of certain other occurrences. This recent occurrence is with my daughter at Seaside with a fourth grade teacher that was mentally unstable to teach a class. And this went on for the entire school year. She was, she didn't learn not one thing in class. The teacher was mentally unstable to teach. She was ranting on, crying, uh, giving kids explanation for her to just not show up and attend class and not to teach them. And again, this is over and over. I've had to deal with you guys and you guys do not want to respond. We send emails. I've dealt with you guys since my daughter was in kindergarten on a recent, on on one incident where there was condoms all over the playground at the children's school. I reached out, I sent emails, I sent pictures. I, I volunteered the entire school year and not one person would show up at the school to make sure it was getting cleaned, not one time. And now to recent, my daughter's in a classroom with the teacher who's drunk on narcotics, who knows what, saying, random stuff crying in front of our kids and nobody can provide a counselor to let the kids know this is not okay are they okay first of all the parents are upset and this has been going on year after year and we always get sidelined nobody wants to answer questions nobody wants to talk to us and this is going to continue happening when is there going to be a solution for you guys to help us when are things going to change that is all I have to say. I'm just really upset that we have to send emails and call and emails and call. And it took two years to get an email back on an incident that I had two years ago from you guys. This is ridiculous. I'm just, I've had enough. Thank you. Got the next person, Pranav Desai. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. As a parent of a student in the same class, um, I appreciate finally you addressing the situation, but the question is why has it taken so long? 
the email that was sent today seems like a very strategic response on the day of the meeting where a lot of parents registered to complain. It doesn't look like you're providing a solution to the problem. It looks like you're somehow trying to strategize how to minimize the damage. We were sent three emails so far. First one said the teacher was sick. Second one, after us sending you the video and sending you multiple emails about what happened, second one said, the principal will now finally work with a consistent substitute teacher with still a possibility of the teacher returning. And the third one today said, the substitute that was assigned will be with the kids for the rest of the year. None of the email addresses that there was an incident. None of the email acknowledges that there was an incident that was brought to your attention. None of the emails acknowledges that there is something being done. A simple one line email would have calmed a lot of us down that you have received material and you, have, you acknowledge now that you have seen that incident on video because I believe all of you now has the video and that there is an investigation on the way and that there is a timeline on the way. I, I appreciate, however, and, and don't, don't, don't get us wrong. We are heartbroken to do this to a teacher who has served Seaside community for so long. But this is what ha it has come down to that to get a response from the school administration, from the principal, from the board of directors, from the TUSD superintendent, we have to send emails over emails over emails. And what was the expectation here? Um, was, was there going to be a response only after something like this becomes a national media issue? Something like this shows up on a news channel because it, the video became viral for some reason? That is what is not acceptable. There needs to be more transparency and there needs to be uh, more accountability when a parent, multiple parents in this situation come forward for a severe issue like an inebriated teacher, whatever the reason be, right? We, we don't want to speculate why the teacher was in, it was in that condition, but to just acknowledge that we have received material that shows that teacher in this situation and we're looking into it. So we seriously, all of us parents together are- Last person we have, uh, Jim Chong. Go ahead, Mr. Chong. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm also a parent of a fourth grader in Seaside. Um, the reason for my call also is to address the issue uh, of, the, of the behavior of the teacher on Friday, June 22nd. Uh, regardless of what you, what the opinions are of, of this, why the teacher was in the state that teacher was in, she was under the influence, whether it be alcohol, drugs, medication, whatever it is, doesn't matter. She was under the influence in front of our children. These are young children, young impressionable children that, sh that she was under the influence for over 40 minutes, over 40 minutes in front of young impressionable kids under the influence of something, a substance. Now, let's say it's medication. We know that Tylenol, ibuprofen, it doesn't put a person in this state. So it must have been something pretty, pretty strong. And I know that if I'm, if I'm prescribed something that strong, it's to, I'm told I cannot operate a vehicle. I should not make uh, big decisions. There are enough warnings, even if it is medically related. If I got behind the wheel after taking that medication, if I made the choice of, of getting behind the wheel after taking that medication and I hurt people, I would be responsible. I would not be, be given a pass because it was a medical reason I was under the influence. This teacher was under the influence and she chose to be in front of these children. Now, the reason that you guys, it seems like the board or, 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 or the district or the school isn't taking this as seriously because I think there's some distinction that because there's no physical harm to the kids, that it seems to be okay. The fact that it's been over 10 days and not one person from the district to school has reached out to see how these children are, tells me that you don't think it's serious because there are no physical marks. 
there are no physical scars. But the psychological damage that she could have done or she probably has done to our children has been widely ignored by this entire board. And I think that is absolutely unacceptable. Supervisor Stowe, you wrote, and I quote, in the Torrance School District, student learning and safety is our top priority. On January 22nd, what part of, what part of learning was on display that day to our students? It's been 10 days. It will be 11 tomorrow. What part of, what part of this inaction to, to reach out to see how the children are is, is that priority of safety being displayed by you? It isn't. It's absolutely, what is being, on, being displayed is inaction. That seems to be your priority. And that you should all be ashamed of yourself for that because these are fourth graders. Young boys and girls as had to endure what this teacher was spouting under the influence for over 40 minutes. And you've done nothing so far. Shame on you. Those are all the speakers, President Liu. Thank you, Ms. Mara. Item number 11, discussion and action items. Instructions to the public. Speakers wishing to address the board on agenda topics must complete the appropriate submission form on the district website prior to 3 p.m. on the day of the board meeting. Speakers are permitted three minutes per topic and the total time granted for the public input shall be limited to 30 minutes per topic. Board policies require that public comments to the board comply with certain procedures, including item three to five listed in communications that I said earlier. Item 11.2, approval for Torrance Unified School District to open a Spanish dual immersion program at Carr and Torrance Elementary School. Dr. Crumpy. Um, yes, good evening, um, President Liu and, and um, board members. I'm very excited um, for the opportunity to bring you um, a dual immersion program for your consideration this evening. Jamara? So, yeah, it's got to get, get my presentation up. Ten more seconds. Okay. <clears throat> and on to the first the next slide, please. So what is dual immersion? Um, it is basically an educational program that integrates um, native English speakers with native speakers of a target language. So in this case, our recommendation is Spanish, that of both of these students would be in the same classroom for the entire school day. Academic subjects are taught to all students through both English and the target language. Okay. The, um, the benefit is that both English speaking and English learners will learn side by side, taking advantage of their strengths and weaknesses with each getting to serve as both the expert and the learner throughout the day. Wanted to start and, and kind of show you some of the demographics um, for both our district and then for comparison, you see um, California demographics here, just as a point of information. Um, we have about a third of our students, 32%, speaking a language other than, than English. 13.5% um, of which are our current English learners. Um, many of our students, why, why the difference? Many of our students um, may be considered initially fluent when they enter our schools. And many more of these students, um, as they go through our schools, are redesignated as English proficient um, as, they, um, as they gain fluency um, in, in English. Um, of that 13.5%, 31% um, are Spanish speakers. And you can see that well over the majority with 60% um, of those 
English learners are in great are in elementary school. So why 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 bring this program um, consideration to you? Um, research has found that dual immersion can be one of the most effective ways for English learners to develop their language and their academic skills. And I want you to look at this for a moment. Um, we're going to actually be comparing um, two of the, the lines. Um, I'd like for you to look at the, the purple um, line first, which is the second line from the bottom. And that is our content ELD um, achievement um, according to the research throughout the, the a child's um, entire career with us, K-12. And this is the program teaching, um, teaching content to students in English, utilizing the state approved framework for ELD content standards is what we currently do in Torrance and in many of our districts surrounding us um, for those that don't have a two-way dual immersion program. I want to to then for you to, your eyes to go up to the dark blue line and you see the difference between the achievement of students in their acquisition of English from, from that purple line to that blue line when, when students are offered a two-way dual immersion program. So what we do in Torrance, we know our students do very well, um, but look how much better um, in it, that they will do if we can offer a two-way dual immersion program for them. The three pillars of, um, of language education um, that are with it, within the research and the literature are biliteracy and um, bilingualism, um, grade level academic achievement, and I'm gonna speak to that a little bit later, and also um, sociocultural competencies. So what goals do we want for our program in Torrance? And you know, um, first off, we want a high proficiency um, in their primary language, whether that is our Spanish speakers or our English speakers, and a high proficiency in the second language. So we are we are really um, um, hoping to achieve biliteracy for for these students. Um, academic performance at or above grade level, and a positive cross cultural attitudes and behaviors for the students. There is a lot of research. Um, we could probably do an entire presentation on, on different research. I've got just two slides that kind of embody um, um, uh, much, of, much of the research. And one is that there is faster acquisition of English for English learner students when they learn in this capacity. Um, we know that learning two languages helps with improved cog um, cognition um, and social interaction with both um, native English and native Spanish speakers. Um, the earlier exposure, the earlier that we can expose a student to a second language is, is consistently associated with um, better language skills in the, in the second language. Both within the state of California and nationwide, our traditional age that we start foreign language is when they enter high school and they take a first year of a foreign language. Um, the research tells us that um, the, by age seven, is optimally when you want to start a student on a second language. Um, and, and we know that having fluency in more than one language helps our students be well prepared to compete in a global, global marketplace as they leave us and go into um, college and career. Um, much of the research, um, and, and there isn't a lot recently because nobody is really arguing about the, the benefits of the program, but a lot of the research was um, out of Canada for French English immersion programs and also in Florida with the Cuban immigration and in a Spanish and English. And, and for many, many years, the research really was discussing middle and upper class um, um, and the advantages. And that's where some of the programs an, initiated in those neighborhoods. There was not a lot of research about um, different ethnicities or income levels or different programmatic um, uh, uh, the effects that that other um, students how, how it would benefit or not. So we are really um, excited to find that our low income students in dual immersion tend to outperform their peers um, at, at even greater rates that are in a regular um, education program. A 2015 study by Rand Corporation um, found that students enrolled in dual language immersion programs, both 
Spanish speakers and English speakers um, have higher reading scores than their peers that are in um, English only programs. And I think also important to note that in addition to reading, both, both groups also had at least as well or better in tests of academic achievement than their peer, peers in other educational programs. Now, what does that last bullet really mean? So within this program, they may very well be taking um, science or math class in Spanish. Um, they may be taking social studies in English. Um, and, and so there's a lot of um, people who believe that that would be very, it's very difficult to transfer those skills. If I learn a content in Spanish, how am I going to be, how am I going to compete and how do I fare when, um, when I'm assessed with people who are, who are learning it in English? So the fact that they do at least as well or better is, is a very strong, um, is very strong um, data. Just a few other benefits of dual language, and you can see the engagement level, increased listening and communi communication skills. You can, you can read some of these. Um, I think uh, maybe a little humorous, and although I didn't put it in there, um, I'm not sure that very many of our kindergarten um, parents are, are really considering that, um, that they say that the, when, you, when you become biliterate, you actually have um, less dementia and, and Alzheimer's. And so it actually having two languages um, and it actually benefits you into, into old age. Um, next slide. So, so what, is, what do we think this program and this criteria for Torrance Unified School District um, looks like? Um, our recommendations are that we, we utilize a program where we have a balanced number of native speakers, in this case, Spanish and English only speaking students. So a class of 28 students would have 14 native Spanish speakers and 14 um, English only speaking students. Um, the program would continue at least through elementary school. Um, the, the earlier slide where I showed um, the, the um, academic achievement, there were other colors on there and many of those represented um, how long a, a, a program may last. There are actually some programs that do dual immersion only through K-1 or they exit students in second or third grade. Um, we are recommending at least through elementary school. Um, and it is our intention to have this program um, matriculate with these students through middle school, at the very least with a robust um, Spanish language arts elective. So they continue their, their Spanish um, learning through middle school. Um, many students after, after being in this program um, are actually take the advanced placement test their freshman and or sophomore years. In Spanish, there's actually two advanced placement exams, one in language and one in literature. And it's very typical that, that students take this in either their freshman and sophomore year or their sophomore and junior year, um, leaving, leaving either time in their schedule for other interests of, and other um, areas of study. We also see that many students as they become biliterate um, actually choose to um, exit um, the, the, the second language and pick up and begin learning a third language um, so they can be multilingual. Um, the, the, the third criteria is that there is explicit English language arts and Spanish language arts instruction taught daily. Um, and this is important. Some programs um, do it a little bit different, but students will not just learning science and math, they will actually have explicit reading, writing, listening, and speaking in both English and in Spanish um, um, on a daily basis. And finally, the core academic content standards are taught um, to both groups of students concurrently. We're not separating students and having different teachers teach at different times. These, this, is, this is immersion, uh, and it's very important that those students are, are um, within the classroom at the same time. Our rollout um, is that we start next year with kindergarten, and then, as you can see, um, move um, move and add on an extra grade every year. So it would take six years before a program at an elementary is is uh, as has got every grade level um, represented in that school. And the model we are recommending is that we start 
in, in grade kindergarten with a 90-10 model. That means that students are immersed into that Spanish language um, with 10% of the day being in English. And that English, as I mentioned, is um, not only that explicit English language arts um, instruction, but it's also everything else in the day that students may be exposed to um, that, that may not be taught by their teacher, or it may be, um, they may go out for, for PE, they may have some music instruction, adventures and art. You know, there's, there's things throughout the day, the, the week and the school year that, that happen and that will be in English. Um, in this example, K-1 um, is, stays with the 90-10 model, grade two, three, an 80-20 model. Um, and really what, what is ultimately the most important is starting with the 90-10 in kindergarten. And by fourth grade, it's a 50-50 model. Um, there are, we, we, before we make a final decision and what we do you know, throughout the years, we really want our teachers that are teaching the program and our site administrators you know, to be immersed in, um, in both the um, language instruction and, and dual immersion training um, and, and, and start do, teaching this. Um, there, are, there are many programs that in first grade go to an 80-20, in second grade go to a 70-30, in third grade go to a 60-40 to get to that 50-50. Um, there's many, many schools that find that very disruptive if a teacher has a combination class or changes grade levels from one year to the next year you know, what, what, what materials are they teaching? What content area? So many, many programs today um, make a transition every, every two years in, in chunks. Um, the, what's, what's most important is the 90-10 to start in kindergarten. And then by the time they get to fourth grade, it's a 50-50 it's a model. Mara? So in TUSD, we would like to begin this this fall, this August with at least two kindergarten classes of Spanish dual immersion at both Carr and Torrance Elementary School. Now, why Carr and Torrance Elementary School? Um, and, you know, very intentional. Those, both of those elementary schools have our highest number of low-income students. And I want to remind you back to the research where our low-income students um, uh, with a dual immersion program are outperform a, a, any other kind of a program. So this was very intentional. Um, they also have a high um, English learner population and Spanish speaking, and they both of these schools are our lower achieving of our 17 elementary schools. So we feel that this is um, a perfect opportunity for both of these schools to provide them with, um, with an additional program that, that can only benefit the students at their school site. Um, how will we enroll? And I, and I, and I, I start with this because as I've talked and talked about the intentionality of Carr and Torrance Elementary School, many programs in many districts, it's a lottery to get in across the entire district. And that is not our recommendation. Um, if the reason that we've chosen these two schools is because of their high level of low income students, then we wanna give those students that live in those boundaries um, first priority for, um, for enrollment into this program. So that, that is our recommendation. They, um, Torrance Elementary starts kindergarten enrollment in a couple of weeks and CAR, CAR is one of our, um, finishes us off at the very beginning of, of March. So neither of these schools have started their kindergarten enrollment yet. Um, next up would be any, any um, family in TUSD living in our attendance boundary that can be given next priority through open enrollment. In fact, um, our open enrollment window has opened um, and we will be reaching out to any family that has already submitted an open enrollment, um, notifying them about this program opportunity and um, giving them the opportunity to um, um, resubmit if they are interested in this program. And finally, students from outside, for T outside TUSD can also apply for a permit um, for Carr or Torrance Elementary School. Students will apply for the program and select whether they are either native English speakers or native Spanish speakers. And if they are, if they are a native Spanish speaker, they're going to be given a short assessment um, by our language assessment department to qualify as a native speaker. If, if they would um, 
be given the assessment, it would be not it would and be determined that they are not a native speaker. We'll we will um, they aren't eliminated from the program. They would just be considered under the native English speaker um, um, group. And so, what are our, what are our next steps? Um, teacher selection. Um, we we currently have twenty two teachers in our district who have a multiple subject credential, which is the credential needed to teach elementary school, and also have a BCLAD, and that 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 is the bilingual um, authorization in Spanish. Um, so we want to reach out to these individuals and see if they're interested in the program and in being. Um, who, who wants to go first and seeing if there's interest with, with our teachers that we already have in our district. Um, we are also moving forward with material selection. And we're very fortunate because especially in the primary grades, all of our curriculum are consumable on an annual basis. Um, and all of our adoptions also come in Espanol. So um, like for example, at Carr Elementary School, if they were gonna be high, um, ordering, you know, 100 kindergarten uh, math um, consumable books for next year. Um, it is of no cost to us to change that order and order 75 of those in English and 25 of those in, in Spanish. Um, so all and all of so all of our current adoptions come in come in Spanish um, already, and and we will be able to easily just change and edit that order. Um, we will have some additional materials that we will be purchasing. Um, for Spanish language arts, that is the, the adoption we, we do not have. Um, the good news is our signature practice, our guided reading, um, that is our, our um, you know, we, that grounds us in our ELA um, um, instruction also comes in Spanish. So we will be able to utilize and purchase um, the, the guided reading materials um, for, our, for our teachers. So our students will have the advantage of, of learning that, of being able to learn utilizing our signature practice in Spanish as well. Um, we're excited to get started in professional development, design and implementation. Um, there's a lot. Um, um, and so the, the sooner we can get started, um, the better with both of our, both our site administrators and teachers in the program. And, and then we've got an extensive parent outreach, communication of program information, recruitment and application ready to go. I spoke about the enrollment piece um, we have, um, thanks to Tammy Kahn, um, Nancy Gutierrez and John Pearson in our, in our um, enrollment center. We have a website ready to go live. Um, all of our enrollment applications have already been edited um, to include um, dual, dual immersion choices on the, on the applications and information. Um, we've got a media release ready to go out. Um, it, uh, uh, it's, it's going to go out to all of our families, our TK students that will be enrolling in kindergarten, all of our local preschools um, will be getting this information. And we're very excited that we'll kick, be kicking off our very first parent information se um, session next Wednesday um, evening, February 10th um, at five o'clock in English. And at 6.30, we will um, be offering it in Spanish. And that will be recorded and, uh, and we will be able to utilize that as well. We have a um, dual immersion at TUSD.org email address and a phone, um, and a phone number um, and people ready to go and start answering, you know, answering the phone and emails um, for, for our, our interested folks. So we've got an extensive parent outreach um, ready to go starting tomorrow. Okay. And very excited for this opportunity and I look forward to any questions um, that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Crumpy. I am so excited that our district will be offering the special program to students. I've been waiting for this immersion <laughs> program to happen for our school district for over 10 years, um, ever since my, own, my oldest child was born. Um, like what you said earlier, our academic director, uh, this unique opportunity to become bilingual starting at a young age will translate into a much higher uh, achievement across all subject areas for these students. I'm even more proud of our school district for, ha for having this program available. Thanks again, and I hope it works out. Me too, we're all very excited. <laughs> um, do my colleagues have any questions? 
uh, Dr. Gerson, you raise your hand first, and then um, Mrs. Park, and then uh, Vice President Han. Uh, I echo your sentiment, Mrs. Liu. I am so incredibly excited. Um, you know, I don't know if Don Lee's watching, but he said, you know, we wouldn't be able to accomplish anything new and innovative within the classroom because COVID was going to take over our lives. Um, and so I'm so grateful to Dr. Crumpy, um, despite all the work that has to be done to make sure that, that our schools are safe because of COVID, she still finds the time to work after hours and on weekends and, um, and, and all of your staff for, for, um, for getting down into the details. When I asked about this program before COVID, um, you know, I was surprised to, to hear, as you alluded to, Mrs. Liu, that, that Dr. Crumpy had done some preliminary work 10 years ago and that there was no, there was not enough support to, to give it momentum. And so I'm really excited that, that Dr. Stowe is, is incredibly supportive and, and the staff has done all this work. I heard you allude to it, um, but I want to reread our mission statement. The Torrance Unified School District strives to ensure that each and every student is educated and prepared to succeed in life. We are dedicated to maximizing individual potential and developing lifelong learners who will be contributing members in a global society. And that, I, you know, like I said, I heard Dr. Crumpy allude to it in her presentation, but we don't bring up that mission statement very often. And it was in a delegation that I was on that went to, to China and they treated us extremely well, but in China, you know, the, the goal is competition. And it was, I heard it from elementary students all the way up to college presidents, to the government official who ran the entire district. And um, it, was, it was a college student um, at, at one of the two most prestigious colleges outside of, of Beijing. And she was the one, because I thought, you know, I had a pretty good whole, uh, you know, pretty good view of what that meant, uh, global society and being a contributing member of it until I met her. And she just punched a hole right through through my little pinhole. And, you know, just for her, here she was a college student, one of China's best and brightest, paying $500 a semester for college because the Chinese government was subsidizing her because, you know, she was one of their best and brightest. And, and I asked, what are you going to do after college? Well, I'm going to go to the United States. I'm going to get my master's degree at Penn State. And then I'm going to go to France to this school and I'm going to get this one year certificate. And then I'm going to come back and my company, you know, come back to China and develop my, this, this plan that she had was truly a global plan. And, you know, in, in my, my grandmother was multilingual. As you know, in December, I, I gave phrases in Hebrew and Swahili because, you know, language is so important to me. Um, I, I know I'm alive today only because my grandmother was multilingual. And, you know, the, what I learned about the brain, about the biological basis of behavior, uh, Dr. Crumpy and I discussed, you know, I had to take a, a class in second language acquisition. And the reason why it is so important for our students to, um, to get that second language, but also to develop their primary language in many cases, because when you're translating, when, you know, when, you're, when you're working in a second language that wasn't your first, you, you have to translate. And if you don't have a neuron connected to a word in your original language, well, you don't have anything to attach that second word to. And so the brain research is behind us in addition to the educational data. I am excited and grateful and, and, and cannot wait to, to help you do whatever I can to, to build this program and make it greater. And Dr. Crumpy doesn't want to say what my long-term goals are because she'll, she'll smack me through the screen, but I hope it grows to, to even greater heights. So thank you for all this work. Ms. Park? 
Yes. Wow. That, that was, that's, that's a lot to follow. <laughs> um, I definitely do feel sort of like a poster child for, for being able to really understand the necessity and, and the power of being multilingual. I grew up bilingual, Korean and English. Um, and then it was only in college where I really had an opportunity to explore my languages more. So I studied Chinese and French and Czech. And then when I joined the Peace Corps, I uh, learned my as well. And it was really such a shame for me, I think, thinking back on how um, I wasn't able to start learning other languages earlier. I kind of just took being bilingual as being, you know, uh, as, has, as doing more. <laughs> and so uh, kind of ended at that. And I, I also just want to encourage families whose Spanish, if, if Spanish is not the language that you uh, speak at home and um, and maybe don't quite understand um, the value of learning another language and being able to, you know, in addition to Korean and English or Japanese and English, whatever other languages, um, the value of t taking on another language. I'm sure that um, you are well familiar with the academic data and, and thoughts about like employability later on, which I definitely have benefited from. But I think just in terms of being a human <laughs> and being able to understand proverbs in other languages and being able to um, absorb the culture and the wisdom from other civilizations from other countries and being able to build relationships with with people in in China in Cambodia in South Africa I don't know wherever it may be that that's such um, a value that as adults right now as parents as educators you can you know our kindergartners don't have the agency in it of themselves to pick up these new languages and sign up for language classes so this is an opportunity that we have to equip them with the skills to be able to build those relationships to widen their their view of the world outside of just the academic outcomes or or their job prospects so i hope we're able to look at that as well and i'd like to encourage parents um, to really, yeah, think about if, and if your kids are not in this particular age group to encourage other families, you know, to really consider what it would look like to have your, uh, have their kids enroll in this program. Um, yeah, and, and for Mr. Rupi, uh, Dr. Kirby, I think a couple questions people may have would be if there are, um, plans or like what are particular challenges with expanding the program into other languages beyond Spanish and um, in terms of funding are there uh, what are what are the districts uh, background there in terms of our finances with this pro particular program yeah so thank you so I I think I mean wouldn't it be awesome that Dr. Gerson in in a, in a few years or so that there would be interest to e expand the programs um, in, into other languages as well. Um, there are limitations of, of um, finding um, bilingual people in, in, you know, that can go all the way through the programs. We find that sometimes in other languages, um, in other language programs, depending on the program, that they offer the, the only like in K, K2. Um, they, don't, they don't offer it because of the, the difficulty in finding bilingual um, teachers. In some of the other languages, um, there is a difficulty. Um, not impossible. It's 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 certainly done. Um, um, I had the pleasure of working in a district for three years that had the oldest um, Japanese immersion program in the in the nation. Um, but boy, were those teachers worker bees. Um, you know, because there is not a lot of availability of materials, and so there's a lot of translation that that teachers have to do to make that work. Again, not impossible. Um, we are utilizing funding. Um, uh, there's there's no additional um, funding out of the general fund for this program. Um, we've been um, we've been setting aside some some money in anticipation of, of future support, um, but um, also out of our supplemental funding. And that that money is for our English learners and our, our low income foster youth families. So at this time, because our data you know shows that our Spanish speaking population not only our largest group of English learners. Um, but as our lowest achieving group, we, we currently only have 10% of our Spanish speaking English learners meeting or exceeding standards. So we've, we've, that it, it, um, it really lends itself to us using our supplemental monies to support. So we would wanna then look at that and see what our data says 
um, in a few years. It may be that the general fund would um, need to support um, um, growth and expansion in, in future years. Vice President Hahn. Yeah, so oh, this is awesome. I, again, I, I concur with all of my colleagues that this is an awesome, awesome thing. Like we all said, you know, I think it's funny because maybe, you know, um, even on our board, we have five people who speak a different language. It's kind of funny that I say I speak a different language. I really don't speak Korean that well. But I, talk, I like to say it because we're all five different languages. And so we all, you know, obviously even on this board, you know, you see the fact that we are all beneficiaries of a dual language in our home. And I think that that's why I think we're so excited because we feel like how much we benefited it um, from um, the school system. So I have a couple of questions as well. Um, I'm glad that Je uh, Mrs. Park, Ms. Park asked a question about um, expanding it. Um, I noticed that other dual immersion programs, they really don't expand it. It's usually one language. Um, um, other districts. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of districts that have multiple, maybe it's because of resources or people that they can't find that are bilingual. I, I don't know what the case may be. I know Gardena has a Korean one. I know Redonda Beach has a Spanish one. Uh, I'm not sure Manhattan or Hermosa. I'm kind of curious if you know any of the local areas around us. Yeah, so so um, Culver City has, um, has Japanese immersion. They actually have um, one school with no, no, um, it, it's lottery only, and it's Spanish immersion and, and uh, Japanese immersion. Dr. Mc, we're very fortunate. I did not do all of this myself. We have a group of people who have been working tirelessly and will continue to work tirelessly. Dr. McDowell, our director of state and federal projects, his children went through the Japanese immersion program at El Marino Language School. So they, they, have, um, um, they have Japanese. Um, LA Unified actually has a number of languages. Um, in doing the research, I found that, that very few of them move um, all the way through fifth grade um, or let alone you know, in, through, in through middle and high school. And so I think we wanna start with the Spanish and, and see how, and see where, where our um, strengths lie, see what the benefits are, see what the interest level is. I do think you bring up, you, I wasn't thinking of this, but I bring up something when you're saying, but other districts maybe only have one. Um, Torrance is very unique, and I was actually talking with Ms. Park today about this, is that we really are a diverse community in Torrance. Um, I know at one time, I, don't, I haven't looked at it lately, Victor Elementary had over 70 languages spoken, and I think it lends itself to the possibilities where in other districts it may be more of a of a of a Spanish you know speaking community, and so that was where the interest lies. So I think if anybody could do it um, in in the future, not next year, um, that that it would be there would be interest in Torrance um, with with some some work. Um, I said as I think um, Dr. Stowe has had an interest. I don't want to speak for him, but he's been into a few meetings with. Um, the Japanese consulate, and you know, there's definitely interest from other groups that would assist us um, in in a program if we wanted to expand um, after we get this one going off the ground. And then a follow up with that question. So just to, uh, earlier today in our retirement, thank you, uh, honorees, uh, Mrs. Fortana mentioned that when she she taught here, she taught a bilingual uh, class, and so I was kind of curious what happened to that. So um, yeah, good good question. There, there actually was at Torrance Elementary, there was also a bilingual program there a long time ago. In fact, I was very excited. We had a, we had a five-year plan when my first son was born to move into Torrance to get into that program, and then it disappeared. Um, they were not two-way dual immersion. They were bilingual programs. And so mostly you know, that, that um, at least that I believe the Japanese program at Victor, where we, we had um, Japanese speaking students. And so the, at that time we, we taught bilingual education. And so those students were learning in Japanese. Then we had a few propositions kind of come through California that required that, that, that stopped. Um, and you had to speak, you had to teach in English only. Um, Prop 187, Prop 222, 224, it's been a, it's been a while. Um, and, and, and there was confusion because it didn't forbid bilingual education. It, you had to get a waiver to do it. And so I think our, there was a, a big um, fear in our community and, and we lost interest because families and you know, the law changed that said, said English only. And so these programs went away. I'm not sure the Victor one, um, but I know um, in the early 90s, 
the program at Torrance Elementary disappeared. And so we're, we're bringing that back. I'm getting a text message from Lori Chanley, our expert, who's also, um, you know, I also have to give credit to because um, Prop 227, see she's, give, she's thank you, um, Ms. Ms. Chanley, um, because it was really at her urging, you know, 10 years ago when we put this in the master plan um, and wanted to, um, uh, we started disaggregating some of our data and saw um, um, and knew we could do better and knew we could give our, and we were, we started working on it then, but unfortunately the recession was starting to hit and class sizes were going up and it was a, a tough time all around. So, um, so we're excited to bring this back. That's awesome. And now we have Katie Crumpy to lead this. So that's why it's even better. So we got this, but here's last, the other thing. Last, <laughs> last comment though, um, is how are we going to measure the success of this? I'm kind of curious. How do you measure the success of this dual immersion program? Um, are you going to have metrics or yeah? Well, absolutely. So, so the great news and, and without going into a huge amount of detail, but you know, we talked about how guided reading is our signature practice and, and guided reading has, has uh, you know, levels, you may have heard them from your own children, but from A to Z and A is a beginning reader and Z is an eighth grade on, on target reader. Um, and so we utilize that and it's a really nice tool because it doesn't matter if you're a first grade teacher or a fifth grade teacher, when I say a kid is reading at level R, they know what that means. And so that's, so, so we have that to, to both um, uh, uh, see how they're doing um, and measure their progress, also compare it to our English only programs, um, but, but also they have that in Spanish as well. There, there are um, many um, um, hurdles, you know, to tackle and a few of them are the, are the um, you know, um, um, things that people, I'm, I've lost my word, I'm sorry, I'm so excited, but um, that, that there are kind of misnomers of people thinking that, oh my gosh, my kids are going to be behind because I'm, I'm learning two languages. Um, it, they're, it's not going to be as rigorous because I've got to learn, they've got to learn it in English and in Spanish, and, and that's not the case. Um, they, they actually are learning the same content standards um, at, at, a, at, I think, even a more rigorous level. Um, there is a little tiny bit of research, and we do know when you learn two languages at once, um, both are a little slower to start. Um, but what we find, so in kindergarten and first grade, they may be behind their kinder and first grade counterparts in an, in an English only program. Um, um, but by the time second grade hits and then third grade, they actually catch up and then, and then surpass. And so we will be watching that very, but I think our, our guided reading levels, first and foremost, our interest level, you know, we, we um, you know, and, and we're just going to, we're going to start, you know, hitting the streets and well, socially distance with our mask with lots of hand sanitizer, but we're going to, um, we're going to virtually be hitting the streets to, to, um, to ensure that our families don't miss out on this opportunity to be part of the inaugural, you know, kindergarten class at, at these schools. Dr. Mohammed. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Crumpy and, and the team. Um, I think this is such a great program um, that we're introducing and uh, especially in a you know, multicultural society and, and city like ours that's so diverse. And um, I think it just aligns so well um, with you know, what, what we ought to be doing. So I think it's a great win for the students. And thank you so much for, uh, for leading this effort. Um, I would certainly be interested in learning more about um, how we can kind of sustain it going forward, how do we expand it like my colleagues have talked about, as well as how do we uh, financially support it as well so, uh, going forward. So those would be some of the areas that I'd be interested in, but uh, kudos to everybody. I think it's really great. Um, I think Vice President Han kind of mentioned we're all kind of bilingual, uh, trilingual in some cases, and uh, I, I just wish that this program was there when I was kind of um, going through elementary because when I speak some of the my fourth dialect or something I end up speaking Spanish so something clearly isn't wired right with me but um, <laughs> I'm sure our, our students in Torrance uh, will get a great education so thank you so much for, for what you've done and and appreciate your team support thank you thank you well thank you again um, is there a motion to approve the immersion program as okay. presented by Dr. Crumpy I, I move that we accept Dr. Crumpy's presentation as given. Second. Wonderful. Moved and second. And um, all who are in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Great, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Dr. Crumpy. Thank you. We will keep you posted. Item number 12, consent agenda. Approval of consent agenda as a whole. All matters listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and will be enacted with one vote. There's no discussion of consent calendar items unless members of the governing board, public, or staff request that specific item be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. The, does any I, of my... I make a motion to accept all items on the consent agenda. Dr. Stowe, does staff wanna remove one? Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. Okay. Then I second the motion. Hey, um, everyone in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, item number 20 is information board calendar um, available for all public to, to see what's going on. And item number 21, comments from members of the Board of Education. A first up report from board representative to the Southern California Regional Occupational Center. Mr. Vice President Han. Uh, we had, well, we had our board meeting um, last week and it went well. Um, again, obviously things are closed because of COVID and obviously um, we're still working through the finances. Um, but one of the bright spots is the electrical program that we just started at um, SoCal Rock. Uh, it's a new program, it's electric electrical program. And we actually have a waiting list. Uh, we we're gonna be starting it and um, it's been exciting. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing how we can grow this um, at SoCal Rock and so, there are people that are showing interest. And so especially it's not easy, especially in the midst of COVID. Uh, but again, we're hoping to bring the students back as well, but obviously with all the uh, uh, you know, situations with COVID, it's gonna be very difficult, but we are moving on um, and we are progressing forward. We're gonna be offering new classes as well in the fall. We just need to be able to come back and so. Thank you, Vice President Han. Do anybody else have any comments, public comments to make? We had some technical issues. I, I think I missed the opportunity to thank our um, our retirees and I just, um, everyone looks so, I don't know if those the Zoom filters or your skincare routines that everyone looked way too young to be retiring, but I just hope that if you do see this <laughs> recording that um, you are able to enjoy your well-deserved break and that um, you, I think everyone seems like they're going to be keeping busy, whether it's continuing to serve the community in different ways or um, taking care of their kids or grandkids, and but just continuing to, to love um, the children in their lives. So just wanted to express my deepest appreciation uh, there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Park. Okay, I'll go. Um, my oral communication, I want to announce that, remind everyone, if you don't know, that it's African American History Month. Every February is that. And if we were on campus right now, I know there'd be quite some celebrations and um, demonstration of the rich culture that it has. Also this week is school counseling week. Uh, please, uh, we provide as much resources as we can to school counseling for those who uh, need them, especially for students um, that might require some due to different situations like what we talked about earlier today. Um, please feel free to utilize them and, and um, take advantage of what we have. And um, lastly, I have a list of classified employees who are celebrating their um, service in TUSD for special years. We have for 10 years of um, celebration, we have uh, Elon Green, Erica Ruiz, Javier Salgado, Jackie Santos, Eric Tucker, Fausto Valadares, and for 15 year anniversary, we have Becky McGraw, and 20 years of service for TUSD, we have Nancy Barbara, Penny Bambara, Bambara, Sandra Gills, Sharon Knox, Bobby, uh, Bobby McGee, Shadab Quadril, and Elvia Salmurin. 
thank you very much for all um, of your uh, loyal and dedicated service to TUSD. Vice President Han. Uh, again, for me um, earlier, so I want to thank our nutrition services. Congratulations. Uh, well deserved. Um, I know that for many of you guys that you see the people handing out uh, meals. Uh, we are so grateful for them, but not only in front of us um, at our schools, but we also realize that we're donating when we don't see it to farm to food. And that was one of the biggest blessings uh, that when I found out about it in December, um, it was such an encouragement um, to me. As a reflection today of all the retirees, uh, again, our district, it is what it is because of the people that work in the district. Um, that's why our district is fantastic as we've witnessed um, through our retirees today. So we wanna congratulate them. Uh, we hope that you will be able to just find joy in your next phase of life, uh, but we are truly grateful as well as we're grateful for all of our teachers, even now, uh, for all our staff, even now, especially with our kids coming back. Um, it was a delight to see the kids at Seaside today um, and to see them you know, walking around and in class. And so we want to thank all the teachers and we hope that we were able to bring back more sooner than later. Thank you, Ms. Han. Right now, if there are no more comments by my fellow board members, I can entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, um, all in favor of the motion to adjourn, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes unanimously. See you all soon. Good night. Good night.